G'day again, everyone. This is Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, the co-founder and CEO of Aureus Financial. Sam Panetta, the co-founder and CEO of Aureus Financial. And welcome to our 14th episode of our live Q&A, Ask Aureus Anything, where we answer your questions, uh, either live or that you've sent through throughout the week. Um, so let's get cracking. All right, mate. Let's uh, let's get straight into it. So before we answer any questions, let's Let's talk about the community, mate. Let's talk about the community and what we're doing in the Wealth Mentor community. Why does it exist? Yeah, look, I think um, we came up with an idea when we first started uh, with the business that we wanted to try and educate more people around uh, the language of money and what they should be doing in order to get on the right path. Uh, what I found in my experience is that most people haven't really thought about a lot of this stuff. And because they're so busy with life, so busy with their careers, so busy with uh, with their businesses, uh, that the time that they take to plan is always kind of at the back of their mind, uh, but they never really get around to it. So we wanted to create a, a very easy way for people to get access to really simple, straightforward and objective advice from people who've done it before, uh, people who have the expertise in order to provide it, uh, and ensure that we can start educating them so they can take more action in pursuit of their goals. Yeah, and look, I guess the Wealth Mental community is just about uh, giving value back to you guys. Do you know what I mean? It's it's things like this, the Q&A session where Jackson and I sit down for an hour and just answer uh, people's questions, uh, predominantly clients that we work with during the week. Uh, we collate their, their questions. We think if our clients are asking us these questions and there's other people out there who want to know uh, answers to these same questions, and then obviously if anyone's watching uh, from the community, and they want to ask us a question while we're live, we'll always uh, place importance on live questions so we can answer it right here in front of you while you're listening. So please feel free to throw those those questions at us. And if you have you know friends or family that you think, uh, or, or colleagues or anything that you think would benefit from being a part of the of the community, please feel free to, um, to add them in. We will definitely uh, allow them into the group as long as they ask, they can come in. We're at about 1,100 members, which is really good. We've seen a lot of growth. We've only had the, the community for about four months since the start of the year. So it's, uh, it seems to be taking off. And uh, g'day, Matthew Bailey to, uh, Matt to yourself. Bailey. How are you, mate? G'day, champion. Now, uh, also another thing I thought we'd introduce. Um, this is also a networking group. Uh, we want you to be able to leverage off the power uh, of, of the community. So a lot of you run businesses. Um, a lot of you are experts in your relevant fields. We'd love to have you contribute. We'd love to have you add value to the community. Uh, for example, uh, Big Matt Bailey, he has recently started a business, Zapatista, uh, to leverage all of his phenomenal skills. We actually had him on the podcast recently. So for those of you uh, who are interested in, in marketing, particularly content marketing, uh, Big Matt Bailey is the master. So keep an eye out for Zapatista. Uh, Matt, make sure you post a bit of a, an introduction to what you do to the group, because uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are going to be able to leverage your services like we have. And look, that networking piece is, is really important. So Jackson and I spend a lot of time uh, in and around the traps, you know what I mean? We meet a lot of other business owners and investors and professionals and stuff like that. And this community uh, has all of that. So don't be shy. If, if you're doing something really cool, post it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, don't 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 be shy, guys. Yeah, rising tides lift all ships. We're here to support each other. There's no such thing as a silly question. Um, so we have to learn somehow. You're either going to learn through uh, your own experience and by making mistakes, or you're going to learn from other people that've probably made made the mistakes before. So, uh, with that being said, let's dive in now. Our uh, our contributor of the week to the wealth mentor community. Uh, we are actually going to give that to Big Sal. Um, big Sal. Uh, big Sal. Uh, he was the biggest contributor for last week because he uh, saved uh, Sam from having to to uh, not attend his uh, his mum's birthday, <laughs> which I, I think would have been frowned upon, Sam. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm good. So, uh, I'm good. what can we possibly give to Sal? We've given him everything. We've given him our heart and our soul. How what else can we how give about to we, Sal? Uh, how about we shout Sal uh, and his missus to, to go to the movies, have a nice night out, and, and a uh, dinner? We're going to do both. Sal, we're giving you. Uh, a voucher for dinner and a voucher to the movies. So and, uh, thank you very much for everything. Congratulations, Big Sal, for, uh, for, for graduating your degree. Uh, you, you make us proud. Good we on you, Ray. Uh, we, we, we're, we're here uh, to support you, and uh, you are like our uh, Aureus child. <laughs> 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 so uh, before we, uh, we make Sal any more embarrassed, we're going to dive right in. So, um, look, 
there's this thing that's been everyone's been bugging me, and this is this has started this started halfway through last year, and it's just it's sort of continued on. I think we're going to put a poll up into the community. Um, I had these clients uh, for years. I had these clients, and when I went to um, say, oh, look, Pink Hearts, he we loves love us. We love you too, mate. So I had these clients, and they they had their, their kids there, right? And the kids were young; they were like six years old, eight years old, and, and they walked in, and they, they must have heard their parents talking, and they started saying, uh, Sam, the money man is here. And they were running around the house, and I was saying, Sam, the money man, Sam, the money man. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, Jackson's sort of uh, taken it and, and ran with it, and we were at a, a big networking event uh, last week, a big education uh, seminar, and guys there started calling me Sam, the money man, which is, which was was quite odd, and we had we had uh, a lot of our our joint venture business partners. We have seats here for them, uh, hot seats. They can come and work out of our office whenever they like. So any of our, our business partners that are watching, you are more than welcome to come into the office whenever you like. But uh, they started again today. They started again today, saying that I should be called Sam the Money Man if he's going to be uh, Jackson the Wealth Mentor. So with that being said, we're going to put a poll up. Uh, I don't know, I think it sounds like a bit of a wrestler name, you know what I mean, like Hulk Hogan or something like that. So if, if you think I should be called Sam the Money Man, um, then we'll, we'll change it. We'd appreciate your thoughts. We'll, see, we'll see what the world we'll wants. We'll come up with another name. Um, I'm not going to be called Sam the Bearded Dragon. That's that's his favourite one. That's like like reptile stuff. I'm not into that. I call Sam worse things than that. <laughs> Sal's got a name. Sal is Big Sal. So. so everyone here's got a name. Yeah, got to have a um, name. Just Sam. <laughs> just, just Sam. <laughs> right. Sam from Narawina. So we've had some uh, some good questions come through through the week. Um, funnily enough, a lot of you have been reaching out via message, um, and uh, I think it might be. I guess we we, we have uh, we don't want to be that tall poppy uh, who kind of stands out from the crowd. Um, so it seems a lot of you uh, would prefer to remain anonymous with your questioning. And uh, <laughs> Matt Bailey, don't deal, surely. No that, need for a you, poll. You have to give us, if we're going to cancel the poll, you have to give us a good reason, mate. Like, you're good with names, Matt. Come on, mate. Zach Batiste is a phenomenal name. Can we call Sam the, I don't know, we'll call him something. Um, you, you've got a creative mind, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had some great questions coming through. Uh, so, look, feel free to post them in the group um, so at least we can get to them quickly. I know that things are time critical. Some of you want to get the answers to your questions quickly. Um, so make sure you're making use of that. But we'll dive right in. Before we do, general advice warning. Uh, all the information we talk about tonight and in any of these uh, these Q&A events is all general advice. Isn't tailored to your personal circumstances. So make sure that you do seek professional advice before you do act on it. So with that being said, we will dive right in. Uh, so first question, uh, as a contractor, when is the right time to create a company and change over from PAYG? Uh, what are the pros, uh, cons and costs involved? So there's a couple of questions there and there's a, an important point to note. Um, now, uh, a while back, the, the government implemented uh, this regime that's called Personal Services Income or PSI. And what it was basically done to, to do was to, to stop people going to become contractors, setting up companies or operating in, in some type of, type of structure uh, and utilising it to minimise their tax when they were in fact producing all of their income from a single source. Now, the, the point of being a contractor or being self-employed means that you need to produce your income uh, no more than 85% from a single source. And if you do, it means that you fall into that personal services income category. So it doesn't actually mean, uh, it doesn't really matter what structure you have, you will still get taxed uh, in the same way. So first things first, I think that if you are making the decision that you're going to start contracting or becoming self-employed, you should diversify your income immediately. Um, I've found in a lot of cases uh, that some employers do uh, offer the, some employees to go contract um, and it's more so to uh, avoid them having to pay superannuation and other entitlements. So if you are in that situation, please jump onto the ATO website and they have a questionnaire that you can say, am I a contractor or am I an employee? It asks you a series of questions and it'll actually tell you. Uh, what we found in the past where uh, clients of ours were getting taken advantage of, um, that they were actually uh, basically being uh, robbed of 
in excess of 10 to 12 percent of their income per annum uh, because they've been forced into a contract arrangement that was not uh, under the right grounds. But assuming that it's for the right reasons, uh, you need to ask yourself, uh, are there any benefits uh, or are you going to scale uh, beyond a certain point? If you are probably, the tipping point in most cases is given the company tax rate is about 28.5%, you need to be earning uh, into low to mid 100,000 after your costs have been deducted for a company to really be worthwhile. So if you're ambitious and your, your goal is to earn more than that $100,000 mark, I'd definitely say set up a company immediately. Um, it is going to make it a lot easier for you than having to go and, and un unwind the structure that you had before and set one up later. Um, further to that, uh, it's about are you incurring any particular risks associated with your job that you need to try and mitigate. Um, a company does give you a certain level of additional protection, although it is, it's quite small, um, it does protect you in some ways. And it's also about your appearance and how you want to appear as a business owner. Uh, some big contracts can only be won by people who conduct themselves as a company. So if you're doing more so commercial work and you want to win bigger clients, then you've got to take it seriously. So um, the pros of setting up a company, uh, you have, uh, a, from a company level, you have a fixed tax uh, 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 level, um, 28 and a half if you're earning less than two mil, um, 30 if you're earning over. You have the ability to retain earnings, meaning that you don't have to pay tax on all the income you earn in one year. Um, so those, and there's some asset protection uh, and personal liability protection there as well. The cons are it's more expensive. It's more expensive to set up, uh, it's more expensive for your ongoing tax and compliance, um, you likely have to have additional insurances in place. Um, so for example, general rule of thumb, it might cost you in the vicinity of, of a couple of grand to set up your company um, and in the vicinity of the same amount, depending on how complex your, your company and your dealings are on an annual basis to keep it above board. So uh, that's kind of a bit of a crash course. It's one of those things where it really comes down to the unique circumstances of the individual. Do you know what I mean? It's not something that anyone should go and do, jump online one night, open up a company and start trading that way. You really need to get advice, um, legal and accounting advice to do this correctly. As you know, Jackson's been talking for, for five minutes about it because it's so in depth. So um, if you are going to do it, make sure you get advice first. Yeah, reach out to us. I, I like my clients to have a mindset of abundance. Um, even if they're not ready for a company yet, set one up. Uh, because if the business plan and your vision uh, is, is going to warrant having that company in the future, let's presuppose that you're going to achieve those objectives. Um, so that we can walk you through the process. So feel free to reach out if that's something that you want to do. Yeah, and make sure that all entities have a purpose. Do you know what I mean? We've, we've seen people that have come to us in the past and they've got all sorts of entities that accountants and all that have set up for them uh, without any real clear purpose. It adds complexity and complexity means higher fees for the accountant. Uh, great for the accountant, no, not so good uh, for you. So um, make sure you get a lot of strategic advice around that and you, no, no one's taking the piss out of you. Yeah, awesome. Now, those of you who are watching, please ask us questions. Uh, feel free to, to, to uh, ask whatever it is. Doesn't matter how uh, how silly or insignificant that you think. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question here. So there must be something on your mind. So make sure you reach out. Ask all the questions. Every question. All the questions. All right. So this is a good one. I followed your advice and did a budget. However, the indicated surplus is much higher than what I actually saved. What should I do next? This always happens uh, when someone does a budget. So they, they put in what they earn, they put in what their, their regular expenses are, and they go, wow, I save 30 grand a year. And then, you know, you dive into their bank account and there hasn't been, um, there hasn't been that amount of money uh, saved up. So where do people go wrong? So typically people go wrong is they, they don't include the lumpy expenses or they, uh, miss uh, or underestimate the amount that their their ongoing expenses are. You know, so someone who who comes and they say, you know, I do twenty dollars a week in um, 
discretional spending. You don't. You, no one does twenty dollars a week in discretional spending. You know that's one sandwich and a bottle of water a week. I'm certain that you you go out for dinners, um, that you go out with your friends, that you buy clothes, that you do all these things. So you have to be realistic, um, and you have to include those lumpy expenses. So if you if you're going to go on a holiday once or twice a year, or you've got those those school fees that creep up, or if you've got rego on your car, insurance on your car, and all these other things that only come annually you still need to include them uh, into your budget you know if, you know if you own a home or if you rent a home and, and you know every year you're going to have a big purchase you may need to replace the TV or you replace the lounge or the mattress or the bed or the table and people don't budget for these things but they really exist you know what I mean you're not going to go the next uh, 50 years without replacing your lounge so these are just these are some of the things where, where people go wrong uh, to fix it and that this is the easiest way it's to automate your budget so it's to bring a little bit of technology in, on board that will read all your bank accounts and not lie to you spit out an exact figure of this is how much you earn this is how much you spend and then uh, there will be no lies and it will be an accurate budget yeah we uh, I think the, the first thing is and it's fantastic that you've taken that first step to do the budget um, and what we find is that even when you do uh, try and account for everything um, and the surplus is different, it's because you are living to the means that you have available. You are not taking that surplus off the table. You are not applying that principle of paying yourself first and therefore you're always tempted to overspend. So it's about getting the right structure in place, having the right software to support you and having somebody hold you accountable, whether it be your, your significant other, your business partner, or a coach, a mentor, whoever it may be. Now, the middle solution, as Sam mentioned, the technology piece, we give access for all of our clients to a piece of software called My Prosperity. So those of you as part of the community, if you do want to get access to it, we'll, we'll give you access. That's it. All you to do is reach out. Um, so if you do want to have the ability to automate that process of staying on top of your finances, even better managing your wealth or your ongoing tax liabilities, uh, then this is a solution that's going to help you with all those things. So feel free to reach out to us uh, if you want to find out more. The tools are available, guys, and we've got them. We're here to, to share, to add value, so don't be, don't be shy. Uh, I wanted to touch on something further that Jackson said is about paying yourself first. Um, that's the whole point of having a budget. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of people, they do it back to front. They, they spend all the money they earn and then they save what is, whatever is left over. You shouldn't do that. You should have a goal, work out how much you need to save in order to achieve that goal, take that money out first thing as soon as you get paid and then leave off whatever's left. And then you'll figure out ways and means of achieving whatever you've set out to achieve, whether it's through uh, spending less of everything you earn or earning more in the first place. Yep, fantastic. All right, so um, this is a question that I got uh, via message. Um, so uh, thanks for, for reaching out, it's a great question. Um, so in the competitive Australian creative industry, how do you stand out from your competition? Now, of course, we're not in the creative industry, but I figured I'd chime in. Uh, I did say that this question we'd ask to, uh, to a podcast guest that we're gonna have on shortly, who's an expert in branding, but I thought we'd give an outsider's perspective because it's very much the same for regardless of whatever business that you're in. So the thing is that in business, we compete in two things. We either compete on price or we compete on value. And it doesn't matter what you're selling, whether you're in a service business, whether you're in a product business, your ability to distinguish and differentiate yourself from your competition will be based on those two factors alone. So typically, uh, most of us are not in a, a business which has the ability to sustainably compete on price. There's always gonna be somebody out there who's bigger, more efficient, and has more, more means available in order to discount and undercut you. So it's a very, very dangerous game to play. So therefore, when it comes to being a small business, our biggest uh, strength is that we're nimble. We have the ability to adapt, change uh, very quickly to the demands of our customers. So therefore, it's important that we're able to uh, illustrate our value and what it is that we do differently uh, and be able to have a very particular niche that we're catering to that we can speak their language and we can provide outcomes to their problems. So the most important thing for the creative industry um, is that I find that a lot of creatives, whether they be in marketing, branding, design, they tend to be plumbers with leaky taps. I've known a lot of marketers, uh, a lot of creative people that don't practice what they preach. 
and they haven't taken the time to apply their own methodologies, their own uh, their own frameworks to their own business because they've been so busy trying to deliver value to everyone else. So the key thing is that you need to, to identify who you are and who your target customer is. And you need to be able to carve out your niche and be able to clearly illustrate the difference between you and your competition. So for example, uh, when we went to the, that workshop uh, last weekend, we were talking to a guy called Cody Thompson and he runs a website called Lightning Sites. And they build uh, custom uh, WordPress websites uh, in 10 days or less. Now, what he found is that he went through the full exercise, and look, I'm sure all of you know how many web designers are out there um, that, that offer a very similar service, build WordPress websites. So he knew that he needed to clearly illustrate in a very short amount of time all of the points of differentiation that his service has from all of his competition. And what he was able to work out is that most people have been burned by a web designer who over-promised and under-delivered. Uh, most people have been burned and, and had uh, an extended delay when it comes to launching their website. Lots of people have been burned in terms of not getting an end product that actually was in line with their vision. So he was able to create a brand uh, and create a, a process that helped educate people around all of those things and how he was able to provide solutions to those problems. So that was just one example of someone who is in the creative and design space, who's been able to differentiate himself from his competition uh, and be able to be phenomenally successful as a result. So you need to find your tact of how you can do the same in your particular niche. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that applies for any business that you're in. Yeah, and I think marketing plays a big role in that, in being able to articulate uh, why you're different. And Matt Bailey, if you're still watching, why don't you type something up, up for us that we can share with, with the community because you are uh, the king of, of content. Um, give, us a, give us a couple of hints and tips that people can apply to their own content so, so they can stand out in, you know, business is tough. So in a tough environment, how can people stand out? Yeah, for those of you, um, please keep an eye out for, for Matt's podcast that's going to go live, uh, is it next week, a couple of weeks' time? Uh, it's a few weeks' time. A few weeks' time. Um, Matt has, has, is one of very few people um, who can hand on heart say that he's been able to scale uh, a business to a multi-million dollar empire utilising um, this type of strategy uh, as a tool uh, to be able to expedite the process in pursuit of, of that ultimate goal. Um, and uh, obviously now he's teaching other people how to do it as well. Um, so Matt... Shameless plug, um, give us some info so we can share that. Um, otherwise, uh, make sure you keep an eye out for that podcast. All right, excellent. All right, this one, look, this one's a fairly common one. If I pay off my car loan, will it help me buy a property? Uh, yes, in most circumstances it will. So let's say that you, you, you finance the car, an expensive car, 60 grand or 80 grand or something like that. Um, you finance the entire amount, you've got a very thick uh, repayment, whether it's a lease repayment or whether it's a repayment on a, a Chadell mortgage. Um, that repayment being so thick, so such a, it's not a big loan, but it's over a small period of time, so it might be over five years or something similar to that, that really hampers uh, your borrowing capacity. It probably it restricts what you can borrow by 100 grand or 150 grand or 200 grand in some cases if the car loan's big enough. And if you can get rid of that car loan, perfect. So you've got two ways. You can either pay it off, save up, or you can, you can use your cash that you've got to, to pay it down, or you can sell the car, uh, pay the car off completely, and then pay cash for a, a cheaper car. Um, the only con for, for paying off your car loan is if you contribute all your cash that you've saved up for a deposit on a property to paying off a, an $80,000 car. Let's say you saved up a hundred grand and you use that, all that money to pay off the car, then there goes your deposit. You don't have a deposit for a property anymore. So if that was your scenario, I'd probably keep all the cash. I'd sell the car, pay off the car loan and buy a cheaper car and pay cash for it, buy a $10,000 car. Um, People get the shits when you say that. You probably don't need a hundred thousand dollar car. Do you know what I mean? Um, you'll do just fine with a ten thousand dollar one, and you'll you'll buy a, a property. Use the rest of the deposit to buy a property. In ten years, you're going to thank me. Your property, you probably would have made a few hundred thousand out of it, uh, conservatively, and your eighty thousand dollar car is probably not worth shit. So um, that's that's what I would be doing. Yeah, I agree. Um, make sure you just don't do knee jerk reactions to these things. 
um, make sure you, you do get advice from a good lending specialist because they will guide you around the things that you can do to maximise uh, your particular outcome. Um, if it's not going to hinder your ability to buy the property that you want, um, then it may not be even necessary in the first place. Correct. So double check on this stuff before you guys go and do anything. Yep. All right. All right. So um, this is a very interesting question. Um, so I hear all these rich people talking about trusts. What is a trust and can I get rich from it? Um, so, uh, and I think that's a, a good question. Uh, Sal uh, just made a comment saying uh, a house over a Range Rover. That's a, a very, very smart piece hold of Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Let's look at what Sal bought me. This is from them Sushi Mango Wogs, right? Where is it? Not spend your money, you'll buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Don't buy Range Rover. So that's that's um buy a house. That's sales sales tips for the sales day. Sales tips for the day. Buy a house. Buy <laughs> fantastic. So what is a trust? Now um look, people have spoken about trusts and it's been a really sexy topic um, and a very complex topic uh, that people have spoken about for a long time. Now trust law has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is not a new thing. Um, this is something from the old country, uh, well before people stole a loaf of bread and were brought here uh, to uh, to start a new colony. Uh, so it's been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and uh, the simple concept of a trust um, is, is, is always remained the same. It is a vehicle to provide you with protection and flexibility. Now, uh, given that uh, there's been a lot of changes in terms of, uh, of the ability for people to set these up very cost effectively, they, they have become more popular. But further to that, they've also become uh, less valuable. Uh, and the, the, at its simplest form, a trust is there to, uh, to hold beneficial ownership over an asset, whether that be a business asset in the form of a company or, or a unit trust or some other type of, of, uh, of, of structure, uh, or real assets, whether that be a property, whether it be residential, commercial, uh, or any other uh, investment assets that you have, whether it be your family home, uh, shares, uh, or any other type of, of investment vehicle. Now, the idea is that a trust has a trustee, uh, somebody who is essentially responsible for managing uh, the money on behalf of the beneficiaries. And then there are beneficiaries which are nominated, uh, particularly family members or business partners, uh, people who have a, a, a friendship uh, or, or an association or, or a dealing uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, so uh, I think they refer to it as, uh, as business or bed. Um, so, uh, but you, know, you, you either kind of sleep together or you, you do business together. Um, so well, let's call it uh, let's call it business or, or biological. Probably sounds a little bit better. <laughs> In any case, it's about providing flexibility around the ability for you to choose how income and capital gains get distributed to individuals who are beneficiaries. Now. Typically, in the current age, um, trusts are most beneficial to business owners, uh, typically on the basis that a business might produce a significant amount of income. As we know, anybody who earns over 180 grand a year pays 49 cents in the dollar tax at the moment. Uh, so it gives them the ability to potentially distribute to their significant other who might not be working or be on a lower income, uh, or uh, to a family member uh, who's in the same situation, or adult children uh, who are potentially studying, not working yet. Now, once again, um, the, this is subjective. It depends on your particular situation. Um, and for, for most other people outside business owners, unless you have a tremendous amount of wealth, there is only a very small amount of benefit that you can get from having a trust. In majority of cases, it is not worth the cost associated with keeping it running. Um, and so it's one of those things that over time, uh, from a flexibility standpoint of minimizing tax, the benefits have been diluted. The other benefit is asset protection. Um, a trust is, I guess, another line of separation between you and somebody chasing you for money, whether that be a creditor uh, or, or, uh, or, or through a, a divorce or some other type of settlement arrangement. But because trust law has been around for such a long amount of time, there's been lots of precedents that have been set that the laws associated uh, with trusts have been challenged and overturned. So basically, if you've set up a trust for the purposes of protecting your assets, if you have creditors chasing you or you are going through a divorce, it does not protect you whatsoever. So uh, it's one of those things that, uh, that the, the value is very diluted. I think that it's been talked up a lot more than the, the actual value is there. For, 
to give you some context, both Sam and I do have family trust because we are business owners. We have a very complex business structure. Uh, we uh, are obviously dealing uh, with a lot of complex matters uh, and uh, we obviously are going to be adding additional layers of sophistication moving forwards. So the benefits associated with a trust for both of us make sense. Um, but in a lot of cases for our clients, uh, it gets to a point where uh, they either don't need it anymore and they can unwind it uh, or they ne don't even need it in the first place. I agree with you completely, mate. So it depends entirely on what your goals are. Do you know what I mean? If you're aiming to, you know, have have a your own home one day and a couple of investment properties, you don't need to complicate things that much. Do you know what I mean? But if, if you've got businesses with multiple entities and you've got really complex matters, then then yes, it's one of those things that I hate to see people go and you know they set up a trust. Why do you set up a trust? I don't know. Well, you, you need a reason for it. Do you know what I mean? To get back to the question, uh, what is a trust and can I get rich off it? It's A trust isn't something that, that makes you money. It's a way that you structure your financial affairs. Do you know what I mean? It's um, it's it's not an investment itself. It's not like like property or shares or a business. It's just a, a, a way of structuring your entities. So with that being the case, I wouldn't do anything with with trusts or companies or any of those sorts of things without getting uh, tax and legal advice. The other point to that is that uh, I think there's a lot of uh, urban legends that rich people don't pay any tax, and it's because they have these trusts. It's it's not true. It's fabricated. Um, there is only two ways to avoid paying tax in this world. Uh, one is you don't earn any money, and two is that you break the law. Um, and in most of both of those instances, it's not very favourable, particularly if you're a wealthy individual. Now, of course, um, if you're wealthy, uh, there are ways that you can minimise your tax or optimise your tax. But if you are earning money, you're paying for it. Uh, I guarantee you. Uh, so uh, it's important to know that. Uh, most people who are, want to be wealthy, uh, want to be uh, determined rich, um, paying tax is going to be a byproduct of your success. Yeah, and this is a bit of a pet peeve of ours. You know, we have a lot of people that come to us, they, they, we, they, their businesses are successful, right? But they run a lot of cash through it, they, they, they don't pay a lot of tax, and it looks like the business doesn't make any money. And they come to us and they want to grow their wealth, they want to buy properties and things like that. The banks look at it, the banks say, well, if you don't earn any money, how can we lend you, uh, you know, a million dollars, half a million dollars, and they can't, they can't um, get anywhere. So while they save that five or 10 grand in tax that they were going to pay, you know, you buy a property and give it 10 years, the returns are going to be 10 times, 20 times the amount of tax you would have saved. So this is something that you need to um, have the have the long-term view and, and aim for the bigger goals. Yep. All right. Uh, this is something that we got uh, during the week. Uh, okay, you guys are always going to events. Should I be going to events as a business owner? So this, is, this was related directly to the business blueprint. Um, uh, business, a seminar that we attended over over the weekend, the conference, it was really good. I was there for five days, Jackson was there for four days. Um, we, we really learnt a lot and we've been working 12 or 14 hours uh, a day each and um, all the teams have been working hard as well to implement everything that we learned. Uh, yes, I think that as a business owner, you should be going to events, you, whether it's networking events, uh, whether it's industry events, whether it's it's business events, you need to continue to to meet people um, around the traps, so go, go for coffees, go for lunches, you need to be educating yourself. Um, the world's changing quick, right? So if you don't continue to adapt and evolve and, and grow as a business person, you are going to fall behind uh, very quickly. So short answer, yes, go to these events. Yeah, I advocate it as well. Um, what I've found is from all of the, the groups that I've been a part of, uh, all of the things that I've, I've done as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, um, uh, these types of, of group uh, um, kind of programs have been the ones that I've got a lot of value out of. Um, I get a lot of value from the community. There's a lot of uh, value you get from understanding other people's experiences, um, getting their input into your business. The biggest caveat that I'll put on that is that I would advocate going into paid programs. The ones that you go to for free and um, the ones where you're looking to go to these kind of free networking events, they're very low value because you can understand that the, the people that are going to those things are ones that have the mentality that they don't believe uh, that they should be paying for their wealth education or their business education or whatever it may be, and they're typically there to take, 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 take. 
So what I found is the quality of the people that you are dealing with and uh, the people who are really serious, the ones that are willing to contribute value to you uh, and the ones that are looking for value in return um, are in those paid groups. Um, so uh, um, one of my mentors once said, if you pay, you pay attention. If you pay a lot, you pay a lot of attention. That stands true for uh, a lot of those events as well. And we can relate to this personally, mate. So I don't know if you guys know, I, I essentially failed high school. I dropped out in when I was 15 and I, I went and got a trade. I became a spray painter. Uh, I worked hard. I bought my first property when I was 18. And I only done that because I was reading a lot of magazines from when I was 15 and that's how I realised, you know, shit, I need to buy a property. So I was educating myself even at a small level. And to go from, from that start of being a high school dropout to what we're, what we're doing today, I had to go through a lot of education. Do you know what I mean? I had to do my year 10, I had to go to TAFE, I had to, you know, do in finance, in financial planning, accounting, I'd done all these diplomas and that's what it, it took not only with all the other coaching programs that I've done and mentoring programs that I've done and all the seminars I've attended and all the conferences that I've attended and, you know, compound that over a 15-year period and that's how you go uh, from someone who was earning, you know, $200 a week when I first started to, you know, sitting here and teaching other people how to, how to make money. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's uh, the... the what do they say? The more you learn, the more you earn. So uh, learn as much as you can. Yep, love it. All right, those of you who are uh, observing, please make sure you ask questions. We're here to answer your questions. The live questions will be prioritised, so uh, make sure you dive in. All right, so um, I, uh, uh, I hear you guys are always talking about the value of a coach. Um, how much does a good coach cost? Interesting question. So uh, it depends in uh, what context uh, you're being coach. Um, so uh, I find that majority of coaches uh, will obviously charge depending on their expertise, uh, on the, the areas in which uh, they've been able to, to be upskilled and, and be educated themselves from their first-hand experience and from the outcomes that they've been able to achieve for their clients. Um, as a rule of thumb, uh, you can kind of get your entry-level coaches from anywhere from around about uh, $150 to $200 uh, an hour or a session, um, anywhere up to ten dollars or $15,000 a month. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, can sometimes be more, depending on who, who you're working with. Um, and once again, it's about, firstly, not thinking about how much it costs. It's about how much value you're going to get from the relationship. So I think the first thing that you need to consider is what, do you, what area of your life do you need a coach for? Do you need a life coach, somebody that helps you navigate the, the kind of vision, the ultimate purpose that you have as a person? Do you need a, uh, a business coach, somebody that's help, able to help you define your, your, your plan and your business and help you get to where you need to go as an entrepreneur? Do you need a wealth coach uh, or a strategic advisor, somebody to help you navigate your, your financial situation and be able to help you make the best decisions both personally and in business, to be able to maximise your financial position for the future. Uh, and there's lots and lots of other coaches in all areas, marketing coaches, all of these other things. So it's about firstly to define who do you need in your life right now. Now, typically uh, I advocate that if you do have a coach, you need to reevaluate every 12 months and you should always give your coach at least 12 months of your time because they're going to give you 12 months of everything they know to be able to make sure that they maximise your success. Now, I know from first-hand experience, when you work with a coach, you probably get to the three- to six-month mark. You've got some phenomenal wins. You've got some great outcomes. And you go, great, this will do me. Uh, and there's this little voice of self-sabotage that tells you to cut the relationship. And a good coach will hold you accountable, give you a kick up the ass, and make sure that you stick the 12 months out. Now, in our business, most of our clients continue to work with us for years. We've got about a 2% drop-off rate on average. Um, so we continue just to readjust and reframe the way that we work with them depending on their needs, um, but they will continue to work with us for the foreseeable future. But we also urge every 12 months our clients, we catch up with them and we say, okay, what are your needs? What, what, what uh, do you want to be working towards? And we either say, okay, well, maybe it's time that you start working with somebody else because those are the things that you need and we can't give that to you. Or we'll continue to work with you, but we're actually going to bring in another party, somebody who's a specialist in another area where we can collaborate and even get you better outcomes. An example of that is that I've had a client that I've been working with for the last couple of years, 
who's done some great things in business, has achieved some substantial growth, but doesn't have the systems and processes in place in order to allow him to remove himself from the business. And as such, because there's so many manual processes, they are doing things so, so manual and their, their, their margin of profit is really, really small. So therefore, we've brought in a, an expert coach in systems and processes, and they're going to not only coach, but consult to ensure that they can teach them what needs to be done, but also do a lot of the heavy lifting for them as well. So I think that you need to define what you want from a coach and then understand what it is they're gonna give you and then justify that with the price. The price should really be the last thing that you should consider. Um, you've got to ask yourself, can you afford not to invest in yourself as opposed to the opposite? It's an investment, you know what I mean? You need to treat it uh, as an investment to see this is how much I'm going to spend, what is the return I'm going to get, right? And it, it, you have to think about it because it's it's not a hard return, it's a soft return. Right. So we, we spend over at least a couple of grand a month Right. On, on our personal coaching, uh, the returns are, are, are tenfold from yeah. the things that we learn. Yeah, over the course of my entrepreneurial journey, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on my, my personal and professional development. Um, and look, we get the questions all the time, oh, it's, 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 that's, uh, that's out, out of my budget, or I don't think I can afford it. Um, and uh, it's typically those people, the ones who are willing to accept um, that they're going to, to live a mediocre life, they're going to run a mediocre business because they aren't willing to invest in themselves because typically in life, the biggest limiting factor is you. Oh, well, there you go. That's what it is. All right, so this, this is a phenomenal question. Oh, look, this right. question is gonna divide divide the, uh, the masses. Can money buy happiness? Uh, no, money cannot buy happiness. It is a, um, Money is a great tool, right? Money is, picture it being a, a hammer or a screwdriver or something like that. When you've got a job that needs to be done, money is essentially the, the best tool for getting most jobs done. Do you know what I mean? Think about it. If you um, if you want to do something small like, uh, I don't know, buy a loaf of bread, you go to the shop, you pay someone $10 and they're going to make a sandwich for you. Do you know what I mean? Or if you want to do something big like end world hunger, with enough money, you would be able to end world hunger. So money is a great a tool for getting things done, but it cannot um, make a sad person happy. Uh, that's It's a completely different thing. It's, it's a, an important part of life. And the reason it gets confused a lot of the time is because people that are, are typically struggling with other parts of their life are typically struggling with money as well. And people that are doing really good in other parts of their life typically do really well with, with money as well. It's, one, it's the old saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So uh, money on its own, no, it cannot buy you happiness. Um, to, to live a, a happy life, is it good to have control over your money? Yes, yes it is. Yeah, I think um, money is a contributor to uh, being content uh, and being fulfilled uh, and being able to have freedom and opportunity. And in my experience, for when we take our clients through goals exercises, um, the typical themes of their goals either come around peace of mind or they come around some level of ambition and aspiration. Um, and that ambition and aspiration is typically around freedom, having the choice uh, to be able to dictate how they spend their time. Now, there's two tradable commodities in the world. There's time and there's money. Um, and the idea of spending your time uh, is, is something that's often overlooked. Um, so money is a vehicle that allows you to have freedom and have the ability to choose how you spend your time. And typically, it's when you have that choice that you have the ability to pursue the things that make you happy. So in a lot of cases, it, it is a, a, a kind of a, a dichotomy. It kind of goes around in circles. Um, you do need to have money to be able to have the opportunity and not feel trapped. So then you can pursue your passions, but it is not going to make you happy uh, on its own. So that's important. Yeah, and look, a lack of money uh, can really be detrimental. Do you know what I mean? If you're struggling financially, that really pervades into the rest of your life. Um, a lot of people would say, no, it doesn't, but it does. And that's the society that we live in. Mm -hmm. uh, the number one reason for divorce is because of money issues. Do you know what I mean? So just that in itself shows that a lack of money creates tension. Um, obviously, 
uh, you know, Australia is a very wealthy country. Most people don't suffer are too bad from, from lack of money. But if you didn't have enough money for shelter and food and things like that, then yes, it is really going to have a, an emotional uh, impact on you. And in saying that, as the levels of, of money increase, uh, the impact on your happiness becomes less and less. So if you go from having no money to having 10 grand, big impact of, on happiness. If you go from 10 to 50, 50 to 100, you know, 100 to 200, those, it begins to diminish. You've got to think, someone who has $100 million, if they get an extra million dollars, it's not going to make them any happier. It's not going to change their lifestyle at all. But if you had someone at zero, go from zero to a million dollars, it's going to change a lot of things in their life. So uh, money is one of those things where it's it's different for, for everyone. Mm. All right. So, um, it's a cracker. I want to retire by 35. Is it possible and how do I do it? Now, before I answer the question, uh, I'm going to say to you uh, that I guarantee you that by the time you get to 35, you're not going to want to retire. Um, I know uh, from all of the clients that I've worked with, and I've, I've personally worked with over a thousand clients over my career, that all of my clients who have got to retirement, even if they've been completely fed up, uh, thrown up their hands, pulled up stumps, uh, packed up everything, travelled the world for a couple of years, have ultimately come back to work. Uh, it's because a lot of us identify our purpose with what we do on our day-to-day -day basis. And it's very, very difficult to be able to have purpose when essentially you have no structure. Uh, and in a lot of cases, our job, our career, um, is the structure in which we operate best within. So I think that we can reframe the question. Uh, do I think that you have the ability to achieve uh, some level of financial freedom by 35, where it's like similar to that last question um, that we had, that you have the choice of how you spend your time? Yes, definitely. So in order to work that out, we need to firstly understand uh, at whatever age, is it 35, 45, 55, 65, doesn't matter what, what age it is, it's about saying at that age, what do I want my life to look like? And typically, this always comes back to the budget. Uh, the budget, the dirty B word, is a great exercise to allow us to illustrate what a particular scenario would look like. So for example, let's say by the time you got to 35, you wanted to be in a position where you had $1,000 per week of passive income after tax, uh, which would allow you the ability to choose whether you wanted to take maybe two days to pursue a passion, to start a side business, to do something like that. So now we've got that number, then we say, okay, well, uh, assuming how am I going to have that money invested in order to provide me with $1,000 a week net? So then we reverse engineer that. So we say, okay, well, for example, if we had a, a portfolio of blue chip shares uh, that provided, say, a yield of 5% after tax, uh, then uh, how much would I need in order to provide me with $1,000 per week? And then we go again, okay, so then that, that gives us a, an amount of money that we need to have. So then we say, okay, let's reverse engineer that again. So let's say you're 22, you want to get there by 35. How much do I need to contribute in order to allow me to achieve this, this big lump sum to be able to provide me with that level of income? And then we reverse engineer that down into today. And do you have the ability, do you have the surplus to contribute and allow that to work and compound over those years uh, and are you willing to defer enough gratification in pursuit of that ultimate goal? And it's typically a yes or a no. It's either, well, hey, I can't afford to put away $5,000 a month in pursuit of that goal or whatever the number may be because I want to still live a life. I don't want to eat cornflakes for dinner. I want to go on a nice holiday once a year. I go, yeah, okay, perfect, fine. So with all of these non-negotiables now factored in, our surplus is now 2500 a month or 1500 a month. So therefore, if you want to continue to re retain these as non-negotiables, and we've only got this limited amount of money to put it in, this is now what your situation is going to look like at 35. So are you willing to accept that compromise? Are you willing to accept that by 35 you're only going to have, say, $300 a week of passive income or $500 a week of passive income? Or are you now willing to defer that to 45 or 55? Now, this is very high level. This is about trying to paint the picture. This is about creating the roadmap. And in order for us to do that, we need to understand where are we now, where is it that we want to go, and what path do we need to take to get there, and are we willing to take that path? So to answer your question, this is once again very subjective. We need to do the maths. We need to ask the questions. We need to understand what it is that you actually want, what you're willing to accept, 
and whether you're willing to stick the course. Um, and if you're able to con uh, consider all those things, I have no doubt that you'd be able to achieve financial freedom by 35. Yeah, and I think it's it's one of those things, right? And this is this is a this is a secret, but this is most people don't say this because people, other people can take offence to it, right? So when you have um, ambitious and, and lofty goals, a lot of the things that are taught in the past by by you know these finance gurus is to you know don't have a coffee in the morning and and save ten dollars on your electricity bill and things like that. Now those things are great to to minimise your expenses, but doing small things like that is never going to get you to an ambitious or lofty goal. What they don't teach you is to increase your income, all right? So you essentially have two ways to increase your income and forget about um, investing passively in property and stocks uh, to, to increase your income. They're, they're passive investments, they're not gonna do enough. Um, you know, you're not gonna be able to do it on a large enough scale to, to replace your income. So two things, you're either a business owner and you really pump the business and the business grows in value considerably, you draw a large, large income from it and then you use that to invest uh, in passive assets or and improve your lifestyle or you're a, you're a professional or you're, you're in your career and you really pump your career and you get promotions and you, you become the best um, at whatever it is that you do and you get paid really, really well for it and then that'll filter down into how much you can save and, and how much you can you know cut off your, your expenses and all that sort of thing. So that's something, uh, that's a little secret that people don't teach you is that to achieve uh, le lofty, ambitious goals, it is much easier to increase your income than it is to decrease your expenses. The important part of that is as you do increase your income you don't adjust your lifestyle accordingly correct no so, 300 dollar bottles of wine yeah exactly so uh, make sure that if you do increase your income you are proportionately increasing your savings and of course you've got to reward yourself for your hard work um, adjust your personal spending uh, by a fraction um, but majority of that increased earnings in order to make it work for you should be going uh, towards your ambitious goals. And a lot of people, because I, I say this to people in real life and they get the shit, and a lot of people go, I can't increase my income. Bullshit. Bullshit. Everyone can increase their income. Everyone can, can do, you know, Give me an example. Give me an example. I guarantee that for those of you who have been in some type of occupation for more than five years, you can be considered in some way, shape or form as an expert. So there is an opportunity for you to go and register an account on Upwork, to create a profile and market your services as an hourly rate as a consultant to be able to add value to somebody else's business. There you go. Done. Absolutely done. Yeah. All right. Next. Um, this, this is an interesting one. So what does financial freedom mean to you? So financial freedom means uh, a different thing to absolutely everybody. To me, uh, financial freedom isn't a sum of money. It's being comfortable with money and being confident, having peace of mind. I've personally, I've, I've never, ever since I was young, I, I didn't want to retire. You know, I've never wanted to stop working. I, I quite enjoy working. I've been working since I was 15 years old. Um, I've always worked hard and I've always worked big hours. I, I probably always will. Um, there, there's nothing in me that wants to stop working. So an idea of retirement is absolutely disgusting for me. I can't think of not having something to do when I when I get up in the morning. Um, look, personally, I, I probably feel that uh, probably in my mid-20s, I, I sort of fully felt I understood money and felt fully confident with it. And I think at that stage, I felt free financially um, because I didn't feel it was a burden anymore. I felt that it was something that I was going to be fine uh, for the rest of my life. And I, that's what financial freedom is to me, not money being something that you use as a tool and something that you use to create things and not something that's uh, that's a burden. Um, so that's that's it for me. It's no... It's not, not, not Ferraris or, or, or mansions, unfortunately. Yeah, I think for me it's about having, uh, having choice, um, not having to sacrifice or compromise on the things that I want or the things that my family want uh, or, or need uh, and be able to, to live life uh, as I choose. Um, so I think it's really just about constantly resetting my goals based on the outcomes that I'm working towards um, and then being able to, to put in put in the work in order to make them rea a reality. So that's what financial freedom means to me. Yeah, and it's not a money thing. I think even I think even with the business, right? Mm. Like Jackson and I are working hard and we really want to see this business grow. And most people 
we think of it, we want to do this because the, the amount of money that you're going to make off the back of it, but it's not the case. What it really is, it's the challenge. It's can you do this? It's a journey, man. Do you know, enjoy the journey. the journey. Enjoy this. The title of the book. It's it's you've got this idea. Can you execute it? Can you make it a reality? You think you can do something? Test yourself and do it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And and you know who you become along the way is is much more important than what you get uh, while you're doing it. So. Look, and that sort of probably flips things on the head for a little bit. You know, people look at us think that we're, we're finance guys and it's all about the money, but it's just not the truth. It's it's, it's not the case. No. All right. Um, so what role does technology play in business today? A uh, huge role. I think it's going to be revolutionary. Um, we had a, a, a good friend of ours on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, Scott Galatly, uh, from a business called Scale My Empire. Um, and he talked about the attack of the robots and the uh, impending doom of Skynet launching. Um, and uh, he said he's going to join the dark side uh, and turn into a, a cyborg, um, which I don't <laughs> doubt. Uh, Scott, knowing you for quite a while, that uh, doesn't surprise me. Um, but look, I think technology is going to have uh, play a tremendous role in allowing uh, businesses to add more value to their customers. And it's also going to be a significant challenge moving forwards, particularly back on that previous point uh, that uh, it's going to be harder and harder to distinguish yourself from your competition um, because the, the competition is going to become so great and so varied that people are going to be spoiled by choice. What I mean by that is that uh, in a lot of cases we have um, this kind of information uh, paralysis um, that we essentially are so overwhelmed by choice that we choose to do nothing at all. So uh, as such, I think that because we have access to so much data and are already experiencing it, like um, for example, like going online and looking for something, um, what site do you go to? Like where, what, what, which brand do you choose? What model do you choose? Um, it, it's just very, very overwhelming. So I think that um, technology is going to be uh, a, a blessing and a burden. Um, particularly, I guess, let's talk about the positive side of things. Um, I think that it's going to be much easier for people to connect it's going to be much easier for people to do business uh, in, a, in a multinational sense. Um, it's going to really break down barriers, uh, both geographical and cultural, um, to allow people uh, to be able to do business uh, in multiple languages, even if they don't speak the dialect. So I think that all of these things are really, really exciting, um, particularly for us as educators. Um, it means that uh, very, very sh uh, soon, we're going to be able to provide our content to people who don't even speak English um, and uh, hopefully have a profound impact on their lives and their, and their lives of their families for generations to come. Um, like For example, um, we were hearing Dale Beaumont speak recently and he was talking about this new AI technology where if you can record 60 seconds of your voice, uh, it is able to turn it into an algorithm which if you put text into this algorithm, it will 100% replicate your voice in terms of how you speak, the tonality, uh, the, the, the mood, everything, uh, and it, you cannot tell the difference. That's really, really scary. And that's the reason why I'm not doing my audio book yet. Um, so I'm just going to pump the uh, the manuscript in uh, into the algorithm when it comes out. <laughs> um, so uh, it's things like this that are, are quite scary but very exciting. So um, I think that it's something that we just have to embrace technology. And look, on the business sense, right, this changes in technology and changes the way business has been done have been happening for hundreds of years. Do you know what I mean? Um, and you need to adapt. You need to adapt. go back far enough and, and the biggest company in the world was a slave trading company, right? So the world's changed. You can't do those sorts of things anymore. What do you think happens to a company like that? And then you went into the industrial revolution and the biggest companies were the ones that could, uh, you know, create um, systems and processes and big factories in order to mass produce things. And then you fast forward to today and it's, you know, you look at the biggest companies and the fastest growing companies of all the technology companies. And, and this will change again. Something else will come along and that will dominate uh, the business landscape. Skynet. Skynet, robots, I'm, I'm going to go move to the farm uh, when I'm going to get a gun and just go live there and grow tomatoes. I don't want to be involved with any robots. <laughs> I'm a simple man from Narwina. I'll stay away from it. But as a business person, you have to adapt and you have to continue bringing in new technology because even if you stand still, the rest of the world's moving at such a fast pace, by default, you're just going to continue to fall further and further behind. Yeah, I think what's really important, and it's something more so food for thought for those of you that are watching, if your job is not strategic, creative, 
uh, or relationship uh, based, it is likely that over the coming probably couple of decades that what you do is probably going to be made redundant. Um, it is because that AI and uh, automation is going to get so good that all of these kind of low level commoditized roles are going to be completely automated. And therefore, if you're not uh, in, in operating in an aspect that requires strategic thought, uh, creative thought, or the ability to build and maintain relationships, it's likely that you, uh, your role is probably not going to exist. So uh, you need to make sure that you're adapting as well. That flows back into your education, um, that you're, you're really building up your tools to be able to be as valuable as possible uh, to the world. And this is one of these things, no one's going to teach you this, right? You have to think for yourself. The, the society in general is not going to think for you, so sit there and have a little bit of a think about this and how you can use it to your advantage rather than get smashed by it. Yep. So um, I think that will uh, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap, we'll it, wrap up. it up. Jackson's gonna he's gonna put in the community. He's gonna put a poll. Uh, should I be changing my name to Sam the Money Man? Um, jump on there. Put your vote in. He's gonna do something bad. Look at that smile on his face. And uh, <laughs> we'll we'll announce the decision next week in next week's uh, Aureus Q&A session. Thanks all of you for joining. Uh, if you're watching this after we uh, stop the live, please post your questions below. We'll get around to them uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, make sure you get value and we will catch you same place, same time next week. Thanks for joining. Catch you later.